the, and the conference organisers. I'm incredibly short, so I'm on tiptoe so you can see me over this uh, lecture. Um, so, so my paper today, as, um, as already mentioned, is on curating Irish whiteness in the margins of empire, the Franco-British exhibition of 1908. Um, so this is essentially based on my first manuscript, which will be submitted later this year, and it examines uh, exhibitions of the Irish in world fairs in the 19th and 20th centuries in Britain and the United States. And I use exhibitions as a prism of analysis from which to deconstruct ideas of Irishness related to nation, gender and race. So a quick um, overview on kind of exhibitions. Um, these were essentially huge uh, spectacles uh, designed initially to celebrate the British Empire. And the first was in 1851 in Crystal Palace in London. Um, and the idea was that you know, hundreds of acres of land um, would be de dedicated to showcasing a nation's trade, uh, industry, engineering, art and uh, culture. Um, and they eventually went on to take place all over the world, uh, mainly in capital cities, Paris, Berlin, um, Dublin, Chicago, New York, and uh, so on. So this paper takes a chapter of my forthcoming book, and we look at the most salient exhibition of the Irish named Bally McClinton Village. And this was repeatedly exhibited across Britain for 17 years, from the 1907 Irish International Exhibition in Dublin to the 1924 British Empire Exhibition in London. As the only substantial, explicitly Irish display at any international exhibition in England before the start of the formal Irish independence uh, process, Bally McClinton offers a key juncture in analysing the rupturing and development of Irish national identity. The village itself raises many interesting questions. Used to champion the whiteness of Ireland, realism and idealism became founding principles of the village. Considering the exhibition of the Irish as a project to perform and popularise the racialisation of the Irish as white, this paper complicates neat understandings of race, which regard hierarchies of skin colour as the prime locator of difference in access to racialised power and privilege. Bally McClinton, in my analysis, reveals that complexion works within the framework of empire, class and gender to construct whiteness as desirable, progressive and Irish. And so this paper treats whiteness as a socially constructed and politically contested category with an ideological connection to th those who you might recognise as white. So County Tyrone Soap Company, also known as Brown and Sun Soap Company, they were responsible for the creation of this village. Um, and it was owned and managed by brothers Do Robert and David Brown. Their village itself contained many picturesque whitewashed thatched cottages, uh, models of the company's own houses in Donoghmoor County, Tyrone. And it was intended to convey a narrative of positive economic and social change for Donoghmoor specifically, and also for Ireland more broadly. Within this, the Brown brothers presented Irish women, Irish products, and Irish productivity as clean, efficient, healthy, and internationally significant. So using the village's many publications, such as postcards, photographs, newspapers, exhibition maps and souvenirs, I reveal how the con commercial construction of Irish whiteness was gendered and became a broader project of sustaining a particular vision of an Irish nation. And we can see, um, hopefully by the end, that the political, cultural and social tensions that underpinned the attempts of Irish men, such as the Browns, to reconfigure their whiteness during the 20th century was complicated um, and led to um, unintended consequences. So Ballyman Clinton Village, as we can see um, on the slide at the moment, and this was from 1908, the Franco-British Exhibition, was said to be complete in every aspect, containing realistic reproductions of many historic buildings. Its main attractions were the Round Tower of Old Kilcullen, the High Cross of Donoghmoor, the Blarney Stone, a fisherman's cottage, industrial cottages, a sanatorium, a village hall, and a post office. Everything was thoroughly Irish, was a typical response to Bally McClinton. And the brothers hoped to convince visitors that the constructed Irish purity of space, object, and person was an authentic Irishness. They espoused goal of the village was to show the remarkable progress Ireland and her people have made in a few years and what further development they are capable of. The project of exhibiting Irishness was considered necessary to counter centuries of negative British stereotypes against the Irish. British imperial narratives conceptualised the Irish um, as dirty, diseased and prone to violence and uh, rebellion, in part to justify their colonial project. 
And I argue that exhibitions became one of the ways um, and a notable platform to oppose and demonstrate against such negative prejudices. They became integral for the transmission, acceptance or rejection of particular sets of identifiers as Irish or as representing Ireland during the 20th century by asserting Ireland's industriousness, cohesiveness and future prosperity. Ballymacclinton was populated almost exclusively by Irish women who made, sold, promoted and publicly washed with brown and sun soaps. And they also lived in the village grounds for the six months of the exhibition. Many modern um, adverts for soap emphasise the cleansing of black or dark-skinned indigenous peoples uh, under the so-called improvement alle allegory, which was foundational to the conventions of Victorian soap advertisement and rested on soap's mythical ability to wash black skin white, as the uh, discourse went. The Brown brothers, however, took a different route. For them, the white Irish woman stood at the boundary between colonial native and domestic heart of the empire. Her characteristic feature was her whiteness, and Irish women's ostensibly white skin became the raison d'etre of brown and sun soaps, presented interchangeably as a natural phenomenon or else as an achievable uh, one, but always as something to be admired, replicated, and actively maintained through the consumption of the right products and the following of specific bodily regimes. Therefore, the advertising model of brown soaps uh, stood as a potential affront to claims of English purity and superiority, suggesting that England uh, perhaps was not yet pure or clean or white enough. Richard Dyer's seminal study of whiteness in Western Europe begins from the premise of its invisibility. He has argued that whiteness is always the unnoticeable center point of racialization, the apex of imperial racial hierarchies. However, the implication of Bally McClinton upends this invisible whiteness of the English race as the most perfect. As demonstrated by the Colleen soap label, the whiteness of the Colleen was fundamental to the brand, being the most visibly explicit component of Irish identity at Bally McClinton through the integral connection of the Irish Colleens to Colleen soap. At times, this narrative also served to work against Ireland, um, as many of the Bally McClinton postcards stated on the back, um, the Irish Colleens use this soap, note their beautiful complexions. Such associations with soap and cleanliness link the village less to a prosperous imperial future than to a racialized and often exoticized colonial past. Even those who acknowledge the Irish as white um, were likely to see them as naturally di dirty, diseased, lazy and violent, which manifested itself into a conceptual darkening of the Irish as evoked in magazines such as Punch at the time. Um, and this was also a, a narrative that was sustained during the tuberculosis epidemic of the early 20th century. Amongst other things, the Irish had to scrub themselves clean, ridding themselves of their supposed negative traits. Um, and in this instance, it would be Catholicism, as the Brown brothers were uh, rampant um, well, unionists, uh, they themselves were Presbyterians. Um, and this, this cleansing would allow Ireland to join Britain and other indigenous groups that were using the so-called evolutionary capacities of soap to accelerate the 20th century march of civilization. Uh, soap was inferred as a sanitizing of Irish identity, its Catholic component in particular, implying a social evolution of Ireland's inhabitants, um, which were shown to be part of the unbreakable boundaries of the United Kingdom. By the 19th century, the major characteristics attributed to the Irish of indolence, superstition, dishonesty, and propensity to violence um, were, were commonplace. And during the outbreak of Fenian activity in the 1860s and the height, height of the Parnellite agitation in the mid-1880s, the English image of politicized Paddy became increasingly bestial and simian. These 20 years were also the years when thousands of post-famine Irish immigrants in England and Scotland began their own political movements as militant Irish nationalists became more effectively organized into constitutional parties and revolutionary brotherhoods with oaths of secrecy, the stereotypes of Irish Celts in literature and caricature resembled many of the features of apes with innate criminal tendencies. Synonyms for Paddy range from Caliban, Frankenstein to Yahoo and Gorilla. Therefore, we can see that the inherent nature of national and cultural identities was developed through a racialized and gendered discourse. Crucially, imperial hegemony was established not only through the co coercive political domination of colonized subjects, but also culturally through the internalization and physical representation of dominant modes of thought by the colonized themselves. Thus, both the colonizer and the colonized were implicated in the pro project of racialization. 
So the gendered masculinity of a rebellious, violent, uh, rebellious, violent and dirty island was counteracted with this constructed feminine presence. The 200 exhibited uh, Colleen's served to repudiate the negative characteristics attributed to Irish men and thus mediate British concerns of a revolutionary island. These women had been rigorously chosen by the managers of the village for their skills at soap making or home industry, their youth and beauty, and their ability to resemble the packaging of a bar of Colleen soap, which is what we can see on the slide. <coughs> Consequently, the exhibited Colleen's were intertwined with the commercial picture of a red-hooded, dark-haired, fair-skinned girl. The girls were described as merry, dainty, and garbed in pretty red cloaks and green skirts, and dressed throughout in Irish linen, um, and said to have presented a quite a picturesque appearance. These women provide one of the most potent examples of the interconnectedness of discourses on national identity, uh, gender, and imperialism. And the village itself appropriated the more militant aspects of the Gaelic revival into a folksy portrayal of an artificial Celtic heritage for exhibition visitors. Crucially, the village acted as irrefutable evidence that Irish Protestants and Catholics could live together peacefully despite heightened polarizing political tension. The village itself was thus indispensable to the goal of British national unity, solidifying the illusion of a homogenous national identity. And in this 10 acre exhibition village, women uh, danced, gave music performances, and they lectured on art and literature. A writer for London's Daily Mail wrote that exhibition visitors were welcomed by the pretty girls with their soft musical speech rising and falling like a fine day breeze. Now you can kind of get to the popularity of these uh, women by the fact that postcards with Colleen's on them, uh, almost four million of them were sent from the Bally McClinton post office um, in the, during the six month um, exhibition in 1908. So exhibitions therefore brought Irish women to the forefront of visitors' imaginations and postcard recipients and assigned them to the cast of colonial consumable characters, products were purchased like any bar of soap or exhibition souvenir. They exhibited Colleen's exemplify the connection between performance and social construction. We can thus see how whiteness can be understood as a performance uh, which works to continue, continually constitute and reconstitute itself through everyday embodiments and practices. This relies on a view of identity that is performance, that is process oriented. Identity is ultimately constituted through human enactment. So if we regard whiteness as a performative accomplishment, we can see that the Colleen's fundamental role was to provide for the visitors a lived experience, propagating a new vision of Ireland as inviting, safe, uh, healthy and clean. So to wrap up then, uh, Bally McClinton village is particularly revealing of the nature of Irish whiteness in the early 20th century. Uh, the processes of constructing whiteness were extensive. Those organizing exhibitions, hiring Colleen's, they exhibited the photograph and postcard manufacturers and the visitor themselves all contributed to creating Irish identity and whiteness. Brown and Son Company presented the exhibition as a typical Irish village with Colleen's cottages and rolling fields. Exploring the labor that went into creating Ballam Clinton exemplifies the agency of the Irish in constructing themselves in an age when they were inundated with negative imperial stereotypes. Thank you very much.